Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to another exciting Business Bytes series on go-to-market attraction today. Um, my name is Julia Schlier, and uh, I'm the head of Hana House here in Newport Beach. Hana House is a flexible by-the-hour co-working space and cafe with two locations uh, here in California, one in Palo Alto and, and obviously here in Newport. Um, together with Honest Access and Innovation Consulting Firm, we are hosting this great Business Bytes event for, for you as well as for our community. And before we get started, uh, please use the chat function to ask any questions throughout the event. And let us know right now where you are all tuning in from by using the chat. Um, as a reminder, the session is being recorded and will be posted on our HANA House YouTube channel for you to watch later. And um, yeah, with that, I'm going to hand it over to our Gia Kelly from Onit Access. All right, Kelly, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Today I'm tuning in from Newport Beach, though uh, I am not at Hana House today. I'm missing Hana House. Um, and as this is our 21st session of Virtual Business Bites, today couldn't be a more exciting topic, uh, in my opinion, go to market traction. In the startup space, we spend a lot of time talking about the role of funding, talking about getting your MVP right, thinking about customer experience and customer market fit. But early market traction and creating the early roadmap that creates the successful scale of startups and experienced businesses, new product and program launches is a topic I'm really passionate and excited to talk about. Today, we're joined uh, by a single speaker. Uh, and so we're going to do a slightly different format variation. I'm going to hand the moderator mic microphone over to Davina from our Honest Access team. We'll take the role of moderator and we'll run through the conversation around go to market traction with myself and another expert speaker who will be leading us off and bringing information. So, Davina, with that, I'll bring it to you. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. As Kelly mentioned, I'm from the Onnit Access team. My name is Davina, I'm the chief of staff over here. It's really wonderful to meet all of you. So we'll go ahead and jump right into it, Kelly, um, and move to the next slide. And we have some folks tuning in from California, and I'm here in North Carolina, so I think I'm the odd one out. <laughs> um, so we'll go ahead and get started. And I'd like to start with um, our guest speaker. And um, if you can just share a little bit about your professional background and your connection to, today, to today's topic. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Gaitri, call me G, if that's easier. I'm based out of San Francisco area. Um, I've, I'm an in industry veteran, 24 years of industry experience, the last 10 years plus has been with some of the large organizations like Salesforce and driving revenue, generating leadership roles. Um, besides that, I've been, uh, which is most, what makes me most proud and what has been my most, like the proud accomplishment has been that I'm, I co-founded a company called Sage Surfer. It's a early stage startup focusing on bringing mental health care to the community, right? It's a social impact organization, um, really like filling the gaps between the care coordination system that we have and mental health substance abuse is a, is a, is a known issue. We are all aware of, of that. So I'm really, like passionate about really bringing care to to the people so i lead the the sales I, I lead the sales marketing and partnerships for sage suffer um we have been uh, at the seed level have had less about have had about less than a million dollar of seed funding so far have great prospects in terms of what we can do and have been built, able to build strong partnership. And we'll talk more about that, the importance of building partnerships to drive uh, really like the next level of growth for the company. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. Besides 
this, I also host a startup grind uh, network for uh, a city in Bay Area called Fremont. Um, so I have about 1500 plus members that we, we provide platform for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs to come join us and really uh, bring in other speakers, including VCs and other others that they can benefit from. So yeah, this is this is what my experience with startups and I'm very happy to be here on the call today and really um, share with some of my expertise uh, or experience with in this journey and happy to answer any any questions. And I'm also very thankful for Kelly to be re reaching out to me and like asking me to participate. So thank you all. Absolutely. Well, we're certainly glad to have you here. And Kelly, I'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself with our audience today. Thank you, Davina. And thank you, Gayatri. Um, we learned that one of our speakers, uh, Chima, who is supposed to be joining us, it may be uh, joining a bit late today. He is on a flight delay, and I know many of you have probably been experiencing that. So today I'm putting on my speaker hat and jumping in uh, to talk about this topic of go to market, which is one that's very near and dear to my heart. Those of you who know me know that I started my career in mergers and acquisitions, um, but I've since spent a lot of time working and helping both startups and enterprise organizations scale uh, through the launch and market expansion of new products and services. Um, the idea of go-to-market traction really for me is about finding that ideal alignment between that early market product that's solving a problem that's been historically under addressed in the market and the right early adopter customer audience to consume that product. I do that through my hat at On Its Axis, where I'm the EVP of our people team, um, running our uh, organization design and working with organizations that are successfully scaling uh, to their launch. But I also do that in my hat as a managing partner for 360 Venture Collective. 360 Venture Collective is a venture fund that invests in early stage startups led by historically underestimated founders. And so I'll bring in that expertise as I play the role of participant on today's Business Bites. Back to you, Davina. Great, thank you. Uh, let's move to the next question. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I'll start with our guest speaker. Um, why is go to market? What is go to market and why is it important? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so go to market, um, GTM typically also called or referred as GTM okay. strategy, um, is basically how do you position your product and to the market, to your audience, to your customers to really drive revenue and customer adoption, right? And I would say with my experience, this is one of the most important strategy. Um, a, a, a founder's CEO or a CRO chief revenue officer or a head of, head of sales has to put together um, because you may have best of the product, right? Best, it, one of the best products under the earth, but you're building a product to solve customer's need. You're building a product to eventually get to the, the 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 revenue objectives that you have so this is where you basically put so gtm strategy involves many factors right that involves how you position your your product right who to your audience how it's going to solve your audience or prospects needs how do you really drive product marketing Right. How do you how do your prospects know about your product in the in the way they understand and relate with their needs, um, and and then how do you establish a distribution like channel? Like sometimes, yeah, you may sell alone. You also have a lot of opportunities to partner and and get you to customer. And we'll talk more about like the importance of partnership. So this is basically. Um, I would say th these like these are some of the like the key considerations that goes in in putting together a successful go-to-market strategy. 
um, some of like something like things that I have used in past and found useful, like something called business model canvas, uh, which basically talks about like one pager that talks about who your audience are, what's your differentiator, who's your channel partners, what's your cost structure, what like how you're pricing your product, and how you're actually driving. Uh, product adoption. So all these like key key ingredients to a successful go to market strategy. And as I said, um, I can't em emphasize enough. This is one of the most important strategy that you would put together. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, great question. Thank you, Gaitri. Um, when you said business model canvas, I'm sure Kelly can agree that is a very important part of the go-to-market strategy. So Kelly, I'll turn it over to you for your feedback. I think I would really underline everything that Gaitri said. I think that um, it's an excellent definition to talk about uh, go-to-market as being all of the elements that take whatever it is um, that your product or service that you're going to. And it's, it's how you deliver that to your intended market audience. And when I think about go-to-market audience, I also would just add in the layers of time. So we often think of go-to-market as um, the strategic marketing plan or maybe your marketing wheel, but it is about much more than that. As you said, um, the business model canvas is a very useful tool. Uh, several sessions ago on, bus on Business Bytes, Shelly Icona did a session on business model canvas. So if you're interested in that topic, I'd encourage you to take a look. But elements that are an important part of go-to-market within that business model canvas include, as you mentioned, distribution, but you're also looking at channel partners, pricing. You're looking at um, the elements of who your early market customers are and then what's your total attainable market. And what does that look like within the competitive landscape? So what is your unique selling proposition? And then how do you convey that unique selling proposition to your intended market audience? Um, why I said that it's important to also think about it as timing is because you might have very different go-to-market strategies if you have a product that has both a B2B market revenue driver, as well as a B2B to C market revenue driver, or a business to consumer direct option. And we're seeing more of that. And so it's important to think about your go-to-market strategy with your product and its unique selling proposition at the center, but paired at the center, you should also be thinking about your customer audience. And it's important because you could have the best solution, meaning whatever it is that you're taking to market solves the problem best. But if you bring it in front of the wrong customers, you may not capitalize on traction and you may miss the timing of your window of opportunity in the competitive landscape. Or you may have the best potential product, but you price it incorrectly so that you're not gaining the early adoption that you need to be able to drive traction or you price it too low. So as Gaitri mentioned, your distribution model may not support your early customer demand and you may create negative sentiment around your product where there wouldn't have been some. So go to market is really this combination of how do you talk about your product? Who are you talking about it to? How are you getting it to them? How are you pricing it to get them excited about it? And then how are you thinking about sustaining it over time? Great, thank you. Yeah. And Kelly, I'd like for you to just jump in and what is one strategic tip you would provide a team launching a product or starting a new company to allow for flexibility and adaptation in go to market as they receive early customer feedback? So um, I'm a big fan of the business model canvas and an iterative testing cycle. I think it's really important to test who your early adopters are. Oftentimes founders are solving a problem because they have a close connection to it. And as a result, they come in with some um, bias, sometimes conscious, sometimes unconscious about who the right early adopter customer audience is. I really encourage uh, whether it's in 
intrapreneur in an established company or an entrepreneur to run product testing with that early MVP to determine who that early customer audience and early adopter audience should be, and to test that the value proposition that you believe is the highest value to the customer is truly one, being solved, but two, relevant enough to create that consumer buying behavior that you'll want to be able to create that sustainable customer model. So it really encourage an iterative customer audience test at the onset of a new go-to-market launch would be my quick tip. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to you, Gaitri. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. Agreed with everything that Kelly said. Yeah. Iterative mindset is, is what one of my tip would be. So, uh, so yeah. Going back to so based on it, it really truly depends on on the feedback. But I would recommend start getting the feedback early. Um, and I would uh, like share my uh, my experience when we were building states of a product. We were fortunate enough to build the product with one of our customers mm -hmm. and actually got paid for that as well. So that was a good, um, I guess, experience. But but then looking back, like because we had the support from our customer, we had the the real like the validation as we were building the product. It really helped us to to bring this product, which is far super like comprehensive and and a, a key differentiator from other players in the market so really looking for all like any opportunities you can get to really test early your product is like highly highly recommend and then it also kept us like um allowed us to keep end in mind because we are always as a technology like i'm i've come from like strong technology background, um, but then working with the users and users, it really helped us to keep like their focus uh, aligned with as we were building the product. So I would like highly recommend that. And then second, that is be flexible and be ready to pivot and re-pivot, right? Uh, and, and that's the the beauty of uh, the, uh, the early testing is, an agile methodology, which is, yeah, your testing is you're making course connect corrections as needed to ensure that you're building a product that would be like widely successful with your customers and would meet like customers need. Um, and, and fail fast is another mantra that I have is, uh, and, and that's where the early feedback helps is, yeah, you're like consistently testing your product with your users getting feedback so if you're getting on a tangent like you you it will help you to come back and say on mainstream so and the one other thing that i learned was be really humble and appreciative when you receive critical feedback right we are all like founders and we have our big ego we feel our product is the best product in the market but uh, and then sometimes be feel it like someone coming and telling me my baby is ugly. I'm not like, I, I, yeah, I, it, it hurts. But I think uh, I have learned that lesson that be respectful and like learn from the feedback that we have received and keeping the ego aside because critical feedback is how it will help making the product that would meet the need of the market and uh, and yeah uh, basically be open to it rate as kelly said this is how i'm going to like and my response is also is basically yeah early feedback the, the whole point of getting early feedback is like uh, it rate make sure they are you're building a product that's going to be useful to your user base hopefully will drive more adoption and and reduce the deal cycle as you bring the product to to market so yeah um the, yeah these are some of the advice that i would i would uh, say to the audience great thank you for that yeah 
Davina, do you mind if I, I chime in on something Gaitri said? Because I think it's a really important point, um, which is this idea of not just collecting that early feedback, but also having a system of measurement for uh, you know, how to receive it. And so not all feedback, especially at an early stage and early go to market, needs to be instantly implemented. And so having a process for receiving that feedback systematically and then having a material threshold or some measure for how to apply that feedback into the system. Um, Gaitri, you described it as um, not being in your ego or removing the ego from it. And I find that using metrics for that feedback. So being able to say, these are the five early customer audiences we believe are out there. We're going to be looking for this adoption rate, or we're going to be looking for this level of iterative engagement, reopening the app, clicking through, buyer purchase behavior, whatever it is, yeah. some sentiment that can be tested, that is material and is free of your, as you described as your ego, but also free from um, a reaction from your team. It's data-driven feedback collection. That's really important there. Yeah, that's that, that's right. And, and and also, like as you said, we could also look at the, the the segment, customer segment. Maybe this is the primary customer segment. So feedback coming from these customers, this customer segment takes precedence on, on a secondary customer segment that I'm not necessarily looking to, uh, to basically like tap into in my like immediate near future. But so yeah, I, I agree. Otherwise, yeah, you, you end up having a list of feedback. How do we really have a system to prioritize that? Because resources at an early stage startup is always a challenge, right? There are too many things to do and too little people to do. Agreed, 100%. Absolutely. I think that's the point that I didn't pull together that you just really did a nice job of, of bringing home, which is understanding and measuring allows you to do feature prioritization and allows you to resource manage and early go to market. And that's key to a scalable go to market strategy. Great point, Katri. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I don't, can't speak for anyone else on the call, but I'm learning a lot just within <laughs> this one question of learning about strategic tips. So I think it could be implemented in a lot of different ways, but um, it's very useful. Um, with that being said, we'd have the tips, but what obstacles have you encountered with attracting new customers after launching a new product or campaign? And um, Gaitri, I know you talked about, you know, putting aside your ego and really listening to that constructive criticism, but what obstacles have you encountered with, you know, starting your new company? Sure. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. Um, so one thing that I have learned um, over the years is Technology. Uh, so when we talk about sales uh, and closing deals, driving sales and decisions that customers make, technology uh, and product play a, a significant role, but not necessarily maybe the major role, right? Especially true for early stage startup where the company is is small. Um, at, in my twenty three years of career, I have had the pleasure of being on the other side of the fence, which is being a decision maker. And I I can tell, uh, and like vendors would come in, present their solutions, we'll do scorecarding. And then I can tell um, that not always the best product or best team got the business award, right? And there are right reasons for that. Uh, sometimes large companies, and I have had careers with a career at like Salesforce, at Cisco, big companies, big procurement process, and and then um, and, and the reason being that large companies see hesitate sometimes see hesitation in selecting a great product from a startup because they may see a risk, right? They may see a risk, and they may be afraid that. We don't know in two years where this startup would be, 
right? And they implement, they integrate their systems with this tool and like be dependent. And two years down the line, that may cease to exist. And then the, the, the buyer would be back in the market doing the same exercise. And then the investment and the effort would kind of like be thrown away. So there's a saying uh, you may have all heard that no one gets fired for uh, hiring IBM, right? IBM is a big name in the industry. Like you buy like any IBM product, no one would question, may not be the best product. I'm, 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 I'm just saying, like, I'm not specifically, um, I'm just taking example, IBM example. I have no affinity or not uh, otherwise with IBM, but I'm just saying this is a well-known slang in the market. That, uh, and so that's the challenge that startup face because they are small. The, the risk uh, is higher, especially for the large organizations. So, so that's that's one thing that I have like I have seen companies coming and telling telling us oh, there's CEO or uh, like the chief of business operations telling us have you been sneaking into our business meetings like the project requirement meetings because this is exactly the product we needed All right so they see a good fit but but then there are like you know some questions that they have. So, um, so, and then some other organizations, especially in, uh, around, again, the big organizations have policies that, that are not necessarily startup friendly, policies around vendor rationalization. They don't want to deal with like 100 or 500 vendors. They want to optimize and they end up picking the, the, the vendors that have bigger tool portfolio, right? Um, and, and then they may all, some also have revenue uh, requirement, like the company that we will work with, our purchasing department needs X amount of revenue to ensure that you are going to exist, continue to exist in foreseeable future. So some of these have been the, the I guess some of the, like the issues which are beyond the product, it's just, and these are something like we are startup for a reason we are startup. So this is something that's not um, I, that that were hard to address. However, um, I will maybe um, as as time uh, like however we were able to address some of that. And I think uh, if time permits, I'm going to talk about like some of my strategies uh, and where we could like see some wins and address this this problem and hopefully that may help some of the audience that are tuning in today to see if if like those strategies would apply. So hopefully we'll have some time um, after this question. So I'll, I'll let Kelly continue with her thoughts. Well, I think that you brought up such good points, especially as we think about early stage companies trying to solve for B2B. And so thinking about runway or that financial runway element um, on B2B, thinking about information security or data security compliance, um, particularly if your B2B customer solution interacts with any financial or HR or regulatory medical um, record keeping. So you might have the best product, but if you're going after those enterprise customers, I think you did a great job talking about pain points that are potential resistance. So I'll talk about startups um, that are trying to pursue uh, direct consumers. And I'll tell you from a personal experience, um, and though it may feel different, um, this is an experience in the nonprofit sector. So some of you may know that uh, in my career, I launched an organization called Start Giving Local. It's a Guide Star Platinum nonprofit. And I launched this as many people do launch startups and nonprofits out of a deep personal affinity for a problem. As a fundraising athlete, I wanted to participate in more events on behalf of charity. And I found a real barrier to the solution for fundraising being asking my friends and family for donations every time I ran a 5K or a half marathon or a century bike ride. Um, 
I knew my friends and family started to duck away. Like, don't look at Kelly. She's going to ask her to fundraise for team and training or MS Society. So I launched Start Giving Local to help people who wanted to participate in those events to be able to find ways to fundraise on behalf of charity. Um, and this was a problem. I did my early customer testing um, in terms of the athlete, volunteer athlete side. And everybody said, yes, I want help with this. I'd love to have every race be able to be a race that could fundraise. Um, and then I really thought I had the solution. And so I went out to market and I said, what if when you purchased a pizza or you went to dinner, um, instead of getting a 10% off coupon, you could have that 10% be a donation to your charity run or your charity ride. And the small businesses said, we love it. And so I thought, okay, we built the solution for the nonprofit and we went to market. And what ended up happening is in spite of the small businesses liking the idea, the athletes liking the idea, there was an obstacle we didn't expect, which was in the validity of this as a solution. People were resistant to this idea of coupons or the idea of asking. And so although the small businesses wanted the athletes to ask them, and although the athletes wanted ways to fundraise, there was resistance around the execution. And so we couldn't get people to run campaigns. We thought we made it so easy. We tried to go out. And what we realized is that what made the old model work, what made the asking your friends and family model work is it was a simple push button. It was this, there was a very little resistance to the ask and the templates were all pre-made. And so sometimes it's not enough just to test the audience or to try to go to market. Sometimes you have to go through the process of launching the campaign to learn about the invisible points of resistance that you can't anticipate until it's in the market. Today, Start Giving Local largely runs on its own. We leverage a beautiful model of um, partnership and sponsorship that takes the sort of volunteer athlete out of the mix. And it does a lot more than it did in my initial vision. Um, but none of that would have been possible without that initial major failure from that first launch in that first campaign where we had a bunch of athletes sign up and nobody raised any money because nobody went and asked any of the small businesses um, when they went in to buy the pizza to donate. So as an example, um, I think obstacles sometimes happen from things that you can't anticipate. And so you do just have, sometimes have to launch and learn. And that would be my tip here. Great, thank you both. Very helpful advice. And so Gaitri, you know, you talked about having an opportunity to share some of that success story. So here's the opportunity. Can you please share either a cautionary tale or a success story about user adoption or company growth that you feel will help our audience better understand go to market? Perfect. I guess perfect timing. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, so I I Previously, I talked about yeah some of the challenges that small companies run, and I've seen those both as as being the the decision maker or or being 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 the buyer and being the seller. Um, so I have uh, so some of like uh, I want to share like how I overcame those challenges. We were not successful all the time. We were successful sometime. Um, and maybe like hopefully some of this would resonate and give uh, some helpful tips. So in terms of, so aligning back to like GTM, we talked about GTM is such a, the, like the, one of the most important strategy. One of the element of GTM was partnerships, right? And this is where I want to bring the value of partnerships. Um, for companies uh, in this early stage, um, right, when they are looking to, and I'm more specifically talking about uh, the B2B scenario where you have a technology product, you have, you're selling to B2B uh, organizations, sometimes enterprise organizations, sometimes large government organization, whatever they may be. Um, so I would, what has helped us is bring, building a strong network of partners. Right, where partners that I'm referring to are not like technology partners. I'm more referring to like the partners that could like get us in the deal, right? So 
maybe there's an, a big RFP. The, the, the customer is, is asking for like a lot, like lot of, uh, I guess, technology um, uh, transformation. Maybe I, like my product meets maybe 50% or 70% of the requirement. And then, but it's a large customer. If I, if I submit, I could be from my response perspective, I could be in the top, like my product could be at the, at the top of the leaderboard. However, I like in past we have seen we get we we don't get to through the finish line because maybe we are too small for them, right? So this is where we we learn this lesson hard way, and then we like as we are approaching to those big customers, we always look for opportunities to partner. P, uh, the companies that either already like at large provide complementary offering, right? They have large, maybe existing relationship with the customer, right? so they and then they have a like a big um, like the ARR, like a stronger ARR, have been in business for for long. So really, like partn partnering with bigger player, uh, so some of those check boxes could be met, and then while partnership is is and then they can take care of like more like the customer, working with the customer legal team, customer, like all the paperwork, all the liability and all that great stuff that the purchasing department like spends time in reviewing, redlining the contract and all that good stuff. And while we could be the, the platform of choice for, for the specific like technology solution. Uh, so we did that in, in like few years. Not we didn't win all the deals, but we we were pretty successful. So uh, my lesson is yeah, depending on uh, situations, like I I always look for uh, I, I determine it's whether to go solo or partner with a bigger player. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we have had uh, great success with that. The only downside of that is obviously when I go solo, I have higher margins than when I partner, right? So partnership would mean, yeah, you you have to be open to share uh, the, the revenue, uh, uh, profit sharing, which is okay, right? Uh, at the end, uh, the, at, in the early stage, the focus for me is driving adoption, right? Getting into more and more, like getting new logo, customer logos, right? driving like customer adoption not as much as as revenue and yeah once we build the brand once the customers are dependent on our product we we could continue and we strengthen our relationship with customer we can the revenue uh projections that we are looking at so that's been a my uh my strategy has has worked really well for our organization so yeah, this is this is what I would like say. And given my like experience with partnership, and and this is not just me, companies like the companies that I've been involved with, like Cisco, they they I guess they're pretty much rely on their channel partnerships distributors for like a, a, a great part of their revenue comes from the channel partner. So Microsoft is another example. So I, I'm just like looking at learning from the other companies and just applying what 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 is applicable for for, for my startup is what I do. So I'm happy to to share with, with you all and hopefully it helps. It certainly does. And thank you for sharing. Um, Kelly, I know you spoke a little bit about some obstacles you faced with Star Given Local. Any success stories you'd like to share with us, um, not just with Star Given Local, but another organization that you've um, been a part of? Absolutely. I, I just, I think that um, what Gaichi just shared uh, really brought, it wove all of the answers that we've had together. Um, it was a great example of how 
the partnership element of go-to-market strategy help to overcome an obstacle that she expressed would be a potential barrier in the B2B sales process for an enterprise solution sale and um, also demonstrated uh, the strategic approach or strategic thinking about the willingness to sacrifice a bit on gross profitability for increased early customer adoption, early customer testimonial, and annual recurring revenue um, to create uh, more learning. And I, I'll share uh, a story many of you may be familiar with, which is um, really looking at uh, industry leader today that was not so long ago a startup, which is Airbnb. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the organization Airbnb. Airbnb was um, and is today a leader in what we call now the shared economy, right? Taking a resource that they don't own, which is a new business model, um, and enabling other people to make profitability about it. They weren't the first organization to solve the problem of having space and being able to share that space. There were many leaders that were working to solve in this space. What they did exceptionally well in their go-to-market strategy was two things. One, they identified a barrier to success that some of the other players in the market were having, which was getting inventory onto their website for people, consumers, to be able to reserve because their money came off of the service fees from reservations. And they noticed that organizations um, that were competitive in this space were having the typical supply marketplace issue of supply and demand. And there was a, a lack of early adoption with people putting their rooms up for share or their second homes up for share. And they really dug into what is the objection that people are having. There was an element of trust. And so they added a more explicit uh, trust and support model with an improved and upfront um, guarantee of insurance for the homeowner. So to increase the number of rooms. And they realized that there was an error of trust on the part of the consumer because the homes that were going on to the websites didn't necessarily look the part that some of the other travel industry standards at the time looked. And so they said, what if we pay for professional photography? And what if we standardize the look and feel? And those two adjustments in go-to-market strategy that both responded to this idea of trust on both sides of the marketplace allowed for an exceptionally strong go-to-market strategy. It allowed them to take a market leader role in the marketplace. And I think that they're a wonderful example. So if you take a look or you want to learn more about it, um, I encourage you to take a look at um, just Google, how did Airbnb outpace the competitive landscape? And you'll find some really wonderful articles about these solutions and a few others um, that really allowed them to become a leader in what we think of as the share economy today. Great, thank you. Um, and then we'll, we have one more question, I believe, and then we'll open it up to the audience members for any questions they may have on their end. So just wrapping things up, um, Gayatri, what is one thing about product growth you now know and wish you knew at the start of your career? Sure. Um, so yeah, I will, I, I knew like as I continued in my selling role, I realized selling is a complex process. And sometimes there's just a hairline difference between the top two, like the, the company that gets a business and the company who doesn't. Um, so I always, so I always take this with the mindset that either I'm going to win this or I'm going to learn, right? Um, it's hard to be at the right place at the right time always, right? So we'll, there will always be setbacks, but no no matter how good my product is 
there are other like reasons that we just talked about play in 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 decision making process so i just like i i'm so i over the time i have realized that doing like if I lose if I win the deal great right that celebrate if I lose the deal I do the deal loss analysis and then do learnings and then move on like have a very quick rebound reset because it's like and move on to the next deal like this is how like we could get into that well-oiled machine that's churning and closing deals um and so, so these are some of the, I guess, the the learnings that I have, uh, yeah, some of learnings that I have learned over over the like the my career, and then around like I've been also involved in raising funds, and as you all know, most companies take um, like have to knock like fifty to hundred doors in order to like get you the, the term sheet that they are looking for. So what I've learned, one thing that I've learned is startup means, running a startup means be ready, your commitment to struggle, your commitment to, to, to be strong, to trust in yourself and your product, however, not like have ego, always be open to feedback and do like improvement, continuous improvement. But uh, but yeah, there will be, there will be like, as we continue to meet, there will be like both sets of people. Some, the people who would encourage us and keep our energy higher and the people who would, uh, who would basically discourage. So ensuring that you are, you are hearing the feedback, taking action, but you're keeping your morale high because if I'm, if you're, you're selling, you're in front of customer, if you're not confident about your product, no matter how good the, the product is, you may have hard time closing the deal. So, so yeah, and the, these are some of the, the learnings that I've, I've got. The, the last but least is, this is a very complex market, right? Um, so trust, but validate, right? The product that you have, the, there are maybe 20 other, 50 other players who may overlap with what you provide. The people that you meet may may have best in, intentions of get, of helping or may have, may it could also, your information could also get into wrong hands. So protecting your like company information, your product information, your IP. So be like cautious in terms of uh, basically, like, as I said, trust, but but validate, ensure that you have um, good, uh, you you go slow before you start opening your, like the IP. So um, yeah, so I think th these are some of the things that I've learned over over the years, uh, which I just want to, and, and probably none of this is, is new. I'm just summarizing it. I'm sure most people on the call would have, would like have gone through this and maybe um, uh, agree with some of what I just experienced. So yeah, um, I'll pause here and see if there are questions. Well, thank you. Kelly, before we open up to questions, do you have anything that you'd like to share? Any last minute thoughts um, around this topic? I think um, once again, Gayatri just shared so many gems I, I resonate with. Um, I'm gonna come back to one that you mentioned earlier in the conversation, Gayatri, which is the idea of failing fast. Um, for me, this is a concept um, that I have always embraced. Um, I think resilience is one of my kind of core uh, personality characteristics. But the one adjustment I've made, perhaps with age, perhaps with time and experience, is to fail forward. Um, it's this idea of not just allowing myself to have a safe to try uh, sentimentality when it comes to work, but when I do encounter an obstacle that teaches a lesson, that 
has me learn like I did with Start Giving Local that um, maybe I didn't have the right answer. Uh, maybe that the solution I thought I was solving for wasn't the best solution to be solving for. It wasn't enough just to recognize that I didn't have the solution right, but also to ask myself, what, what can change? What can be different? What can I learn from this to move forward? Um, to continue to allow this passion I feel for solving this problem um, to be able to be purposeful. So I, I really believe in this idea of failing forward. I also believe in the, the pillars on either side of, of what you were saying about surrounding yourself with people who can help you learn the lessons you need to learn to create the best product, um, who help you maintain your enthusiasm for solving the problem that you're trying to solve, uh, but also who are able to teach you uh, the things that may be in your blind spot that you don't know. So bringing the people around you uh, that allow you to learn the lessons and fail forward. Um, but also you don't have to invent every element. So though, though there's a lot of quick success items out there that'll tell you if you just follow this funnel, this ad, this tool, um, you know, you'll be on your key to X revenue growth. Um, and, and those may be misleading some of the time. There may be truths that you can pull out of elements. You don't have to build everything from scratch. And so try to find that space in between um, of trying to create your own path and then also learning from others and leveraging others' expertise. Yeah, truly agree. Yeah, there, there are a lot of tools out there uh, and a lot of frameworks out there. So totally agree that, yeah, you don't need to, um, the problem, many problems that you will face have been faced by others and, and solved in some form or the other. So um, yeah, and the continuous learning is, is your friend. So yeah, the, the, the one last thing that I, I also learned was relationship. Uh, so yeah, whether it's a relationship with, with your, um, with your customer prospects, just yeah, people like to work with with be people that that are good to work with. So mm -hmm. like have, like elevating the customer experience, keeping the customer experience in mind, uh, like customer prospect, whatever. Be a genuine person, be a pleasing person to to most extent. So I think that that has helped me, uh, and I always continue to improve. Ho hopefully, I'm continuing to improve on that. So. Great. Well, thank you to the both of you for sharing all of your expertise and knowledge. I'd like to take some time to open it up to our audience members to see if they have any questions at this time um, that, you know, you guys can impart some of your knowledge to. Sure. And you can ask either by unmuting yourself or through chat. Um, you can send it directly to me or Kelly or Julia whatever you're comfortable with. While we wait for that to come in, I'll just say that if there's a, a sound bite that will adjoin the recording of this, it'll be continuous learning as your friend. I, I think that that is just such a wonderful takeaway um, for the topic, specifically for the topic of go-to-market. Um, it is not a roadmap created once, but it is definitely a continuous learning roadmap. It's one that will continue to adjust as you adopt new customer segments um, and as your product expands and as your learning expands. Agreed. I think I'm not seeing any questions. Hi. Oh, great. Hello. Um, my name is Bayan. I work in tech. I was curious as to what the what does a business model canvas include? Um, so you talked about it a little bit um, in the beginning, but as to specifics of what it includes. Sure. Uh, Kelly, do you want me to take it? Uh, do you want? That's great. Please. Okay. Yeah. So business model includes a, 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 I guess the, the key, all the key ingredients that will make your company successful, right? So that includes 
what what is the product what is the product vision what is the value that it's providing to your customer and everything has to fit in in one sheet like one page so it it cannot be a five page value proposition about your product so it has to be really crisp and brief uh, in terms of wh- what is the value proposition what is the problem that you're solving what are the customer like what who are your customer like segments which customers are you are focusing maybe i have a healthcare company and um and maybe my customer segment would be maybe healthcare providers like the hospitals maybe insurance companies maybe right so if you have a b2 b2 b2c company then maybe you're building a product for kids then maybe um the parents would be your customers right the, the mm-hmm. so and then including how you are going to drive the the distribution are you going to just sell it like you will rely on your sales team or you are going to have your partner network so maybe if you have a like going back to if you have a b2b2c model if you are building a product for the kids maybe a toy maybe you would do direct selling on your website and then maybe you would also partner with uh, some of the toy companies right and then maybe like maybe have uh, like leverage them as your channel partners um and then basically what's what's the cost uh, for some some technology product it could be subscription model it could be software cost it could be for for the toy it could be a maybe a 39.99 dollar cost on retail and maybe for like wholesale cost is probably 29.9 like 99 so some of those cost structures and then the, the revenue streams where you are going to get the revenue from so that would be okay direct selling partnerships and maybe you would like partner with maybe a, a nursery that and then maybe you that has a a franchisee of like 50 different locations and maybe you do uh you have a big contract and so this could be like the large scale deployments that you may have so depending on like the the different revenue streams that you would have so this basically the benefit of business model canvas is it gives you it gives you an opportunity to think about very crisply in terms of your product strengths your your channel market strategy your cost and your revenue and how you would like cus- who who are your customers and how are you delighting them so um if you i think it's very well known if you go uh, google it you would see some of the templates um uh, that you potentially like use to put your thoughts together and that's yeah. basically just aligning the thoughts and and working towards uh, growing uh, growing the business and i will hand it over to kelly if i missed anything i i will just share that divina shared um the strategizer creative commons business model canvas which is a template that you can use mm-hmm. um that you can fill in the blanks on uh directly to the chat so if you're curious and want to learn more um that link will take you to both the canvas itself as well as some tips for how to think about each of the segments i think that you did a great job overlapping it but um the segments from key partners key activities key resources cost structure value proposition revenue streams these kind of customer relationships the channels of taking something to market and then your customer segmentation so those are the elements that you'd find on that business model if you want more input on it um take a look at the business model uh, and product strategy session that we did in the past here on business bites Mm-hmm. And with that, we'll talk about our next business bites. I'll bring it back over to you, Julia. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for being flexible today. Um, thank you Gayatri, um, Kelly, Davina and everyone who just joined us today. Um, so please mark your calendar for the, our next business bites uh, scheduled for September 14 about our exceptional leadership strategies for leading and enduring company so um please um you know mark your calendar and before we all hang up i want to drop a link in the chat right now um it is yeah i think i just posted um it is a survey link to 
you know, get your feedback on how we do and what we can make it better. So it's super important for us to 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 see that as well as yeah. Thanks for tuning in, and yeah, and hope to see you next time uh, again at 